We are about to get started. Thank you for coming today. <clears throat> um, to start off the Waters Life Community Forum, I would like to invite Joe Seymour, who is Squaxin and Akama, up here to share a song with us. Um, to all Gwalapu, Gwalapu Tanishad, Gwalapu Tanishad. To all you folks, you are my friends. Welcome. Wahalatu uh, Titsta. My name is Joe Seymour, Squaxin Upschus. I'm from Squaxin. I stand here with my cousin, Patricia, who's also Squaxin. <laughs> and uh, the song we'll be opening with is uh, a song that comes from Nia Bay called Thanking the Creator. Hey oh, hey oh, hey oh, oh yeah, ah, yeah. Hey oh, hey oh, hey oh, oh yeah, ah, yeah. What hey?
Let's all thank Joe and Patricia for providing us with a beautiful opening for our Water is Life Community Forum. We often call upon Joe Seymour, who is a current student here at Evergreen, to help us with our cultural work. And that work is always very important, and he, without hesitation, always steps forward and says yes, and he helps us in the best way possible. But at the same time, we understand that the balance to the seriousness of sacredness and ceremony is the capacity to laugh and to have joy. So one of the things that I'm happy to share with you is that at our Longhouse Community Dinner, we recently awarded Joe with a special award to embody his spirit of laughter that he also brings to us at the Longhouse, the Spam Award. So let's hear it for Joe. My name is Tina Kukan Miller. I'm the director of our Longhouse Education and Cultural Center at the Evergreen State College. And our Longhouse is known as Squigwealt, the House of Welcome. And that's a name that was gifted to us by Northwest spiritual leaders and elders. And it's something that we all need to live up to in our everyday walk of life. So that beautiful vision to have a gathering place for people of all cultures is something that we've been witness to in the over 21 years that the Longhouse has been open. So with that, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. The good thoughts and prayers in your hearts and the energy that you have, your concern about the water, and that's why we're here today. So I'd like to greet you in my language, which is, I'm Ojibwe from Wisconsin, and say, Bujun and Maganido, greetings my relatives. And I'm a member of the Martin clan, and my tribe is the Lacto Flambo Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. But we say Waswaganing and Donjaba because the place of the flaming torch is where my spirit resides. So I appreciate being able to say a few words of welcome to you today. And also, that we had a very special opening with Joe and Patricia that are reminding us that our beautiful Evergreen State College is located on the Medicine Creek Treaty Nation's territories and the peoples of the Southern Salish Sea. This is where they have lived, gathered, traded for centuries, millennia. I'd like to share with you a water prophecy that was shared with my people, the Anishinaabe people of the Great Lakes area. Over a decade ago, we were gathered near the shores of Lake Superior, which we know as Gichigaming. And our spiritual leader, Bodwewood and Bene Si of the Lakutare Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe, shared an important teaching, a prophecy about the water that within a few short decades, water would become so scarce and there would be such a battle over clean water that only people with the most resources would have access to clean water. He said, unless mankind learns to change its ways, this is the prophecy that we'll see fulfilling before our eyes. And at the time when he shared that teaching, it even wasn't very common that you would be purchasing bottled water. It was almost sort of inconceivable that people would be selling water. But we're all familiar with where we're at today. And uh, water rights are one of the most important rights in Indian country in our legal system. And as we look today of what's happening and the threats to our water, it's an issue that impacts all of us. And there are things that we can all do. And as we saw a lot of people traveling to Standing Rock to stand with our brothers and sisters, not everyone was able to travel. And so we began to think, well, what can we do? And we looked around and said, well, we're artists, scholars, activists, protectors. So everything that we can do on our own also helps with that initiative. So at that time when the water prophecy was shared, one of my cultural mentors, Anishinaabe grandmother Josephine Mandaman said, well, what can I do? I'm a grandmother. And she heard in the prophecy that hope, when Badwewadan said, if mankind changes his ways. And she said, well, as a grandmother, I know I can take a step, and I can take another step. And that grandmother, she wore out eight pairs of tennis shoes as she walked around each of the Great Lakes, drawing attention to the need to protect our waters. 
carrying a pail of water that had been prayed over. And it wasn't just that the women began to walk, but we also understand the need to have our men standing with us and alongside us. After she walked around each of the Great Lakes, it was announced that we would be walking across the entire continent and that the Evergreen State College could be the location for the Western Water Walk. So right here at our own Bashua Ali Point at the Evergreen State College, we offered a ceremony to the water and Grandma Josephine began to walk. And we just ran right after her. And there are many people that are in this room that participated in that as well. And yes, that water was walked all the way across the United States to Lake Superior. And yes, it was walked across White Pass during a blizzard when the Yakima people came and they said, we understand that you need help and you need support. And that was the way that the spirit was working, that Grandma Josephine doesn't plan, she doesn't go after grants, you know, that's what I'm used to doing. <laughs> but she, has, she just takes the message of the spirit and she starts to walk and we all just race to try to catch up to her. So with her face, she began walking. And yes, of course, the walkers made it all the way to Lake Superior. The Southern walkers began to walk on the anniversary of the BP oil spill of the Gulf of Mexico, and they joined at Lake Superior. And the Eastern water walkers began at Machias, Maine, and began their journey and met up with us. And then the Northern walkers began at Hudson Bay and joined at a beautiful converging of the water ceremony in June of 2011. The next year, 2012, the Squaxin Island tribe hosted the tribal canoe journey out here in the Northwest. And waters from our beautiful Lake Superior Gichigaming were brought as we were requested to do by the Squaxin Island Tribal Council. And people brought their waters from all across Turtle Island to share and exchange and pour into the beautiful Salish Sea. If you're wondering if there's a new water walk being, of plan being planned currently, there is. And this one will retrace the steps of our Anishinaabe ancestors beginning in Duluth on April 19th and retracing back along the St. Lawrence Seaway. This fulfills a prophecy where we retrace the steps of our ancestors to find what they have left for us. So you can see that you can get more information on Facebook if you search that particular name for the Earth and Water Walk 2017 with Josephine Mondaman. One of our members of our spiritual society composed a song. Every day she and her grandson would drive past this beautiful body of water and they would talk to the water as they were praying to the water and the grandson said, well, why aren't we singing to her? And so Doreen Day, who's known as Wabanokwe, she's our head woman singer in our lodge and so she composed a song and we don't often share our songs publicly, but we're sharing this song. And it's, since it's out on the internet and you're all invited to learn it, I've asked some of my sisters to come and help us sing it. So you can see that the words here are saying, water, we love you, we thank you, we respect you. So as the singers are coming forward, I'll explain the pronunciation and we will sing it through twice. And then we're inviting all of you to join in singing the third and fourth time. And in the sharing of that song, it was said that this is a song gifted to the world, and you're each invited to translate that into your own indigenous language or to whatever language, or continue to use the song as you're standing near the water. So I'd like to call upon the sisters and then auntie who have agreed to come help us teach this beautiful water song to you.
If you'd like to thank these beautiful Anishinaabe Kwe women, let's all say at the count of three, miigwech. One, two, three, miigwech. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's an honor to introduce at this time Rachel Plenty Wolf. And I first met Rachel when she was coming through the doors of the Longhouse as a new student at the Evergreen State College and has continued to remain active with our Native Student Alliance. She's going to be our moderator for today, and she's going to introduce our panel, give you opportunities for questions and answers. And I would like to say that we're here today as part of the work of the Equity Council. I'd like to acknowledge our president, Dr. George Bridges, the new president to the Evergreen State College, and let's give him a warm welcome. So this is part of the work of the Equity Council, and uh, we're very grateful to have great student leaders. So if there are Equity Council members here, if we could please just give a wave so that we can recognize who's doing the work for equity and inclusion at the Evergreen State College, Kennedy Flores. And that this is a collaboration among the Equity Council, the Native programs at the Evergreen State College, and our Native Student Alliance. So let's hear it for Native Student Alliance. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Plenty Wolf. Hi, my name is Rachel Plenty Wolf and I'm Ogallala Lakota and I'm a student here. Minnie Wachoni, welcome to the Water is Life panel. The Water is Life Community Forum will explore the impact of energy extraction on the Earth's waterways, the effects of such development in indigenous communities and indigenous people's approaches to resistance. I'm very excited for this panel, and I'd like to um, have the panel themselves introduce them so that I don't butcher any names. <laughs> um, everyone gets around 15 minutes, and at the end, there will be a 10-minute Q&A for the public. So, um, Noelle Parrish and Patricia Green is next. Oh, hello. Is it Zoltan? Are you first? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Noel and Pat Parrish, Patricia Green, please come up. <laughs> nice. I'll stand here. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Anin ende na benwe agan indo jwe nevanagan ego nindishnaka ojwashke kezig ekwe. Noel Parish. In Dorem Che Che Jacques, in Donje Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, 
Um, miigwech, chi miigwech. Hello, my relatives. I do not speak much Ojibwe Moen, although I do my best to uh, learn and speak it. Uh, my ancestral name is Ojwashke Gazig Akwe, and uh, my legal name is Noel Parrish. Uh, my clan is Crane Clan, and I come from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. Thank you to the for forum organizers, to Tina and Aaron and the others who organized this today for asking us to speak. And thank you to um, the people of the Medicine Creek Treaty uh, for, you know, and your ancestors that are here with us today. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, and I'll have Patricia introduce herself. Twa gulapu gulapu tadishid. Twa gulapu gulapu tadishid. Bloops teeth stud. Bloops teeth stud. Squawks it up shed. Squawks it up shed. Hello to all of you, all of you kind people. I am Baloops from Squaxin Island. Um, that is a greeting that we usually use on our canoe journeys. So if you've heard it before, it sounds familiar, you probably have on journeys. Um, I am from Squaxin. My mother is Donna Penn. Uh, my grandmother is the late Myrtle Richards. And my grandfather is Big Bill Penn from Quileute. Um, and I just want to thank you for allowing me to be here today and share a little bit of our journey and how we um, helped bring attention to what's going on over at Standing Rock. So thank you. <clears throat> oh. That seems like it's not. So today, um, this talk is gonna, we're gonna cover a cultural perspective around, you know, the water and water is life for both Patricia and I, and um, talk about a little bit the local activities that have happened, some of the ones that we've led and participated in, and um, so the water protection rallies, marches, and prayer circles that have been going on here in Olympia and Thurston County. Um, also, uh, we, there's been a formation of an indigenous council that was really an action taken after, you know, the Standing Rock um, movement really got a lot of us motivated and connected to each other. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that uh, happened and our relations. <clears throat> I think I'm pressing the wrong button. <laughs> so be patient with me. <laughs> Okay, so um, I am really grateful to be here and uh, I have to say that I'm really humbled to come here as Anishinaabe Akwe and talk with you all um, in, our, in our way and try to live my life in the Sundance way as best as possible, um, one of our um, sacred uh, ceremonies and um, and our cultural ceremonies as well as um, the I get to be here and you know from our perspective as Anishinaabe Akwe we as women are protectors of the water by birth and um, that's part of what we do we carry the water and we carry it within ourselves and so walking in that way where prayers for the water um, are something that we're responsible to do. And so that's, um, with all of these callings, you know, from Grandma Josephine Mandeman to the, and the prophecy, um, as well as my elders uh, back home in Turtle Mountain is in North Dakota. It's about three hours north of Standing Rock. Um, we have a high rate of cancer. I think 60 to 80% of our reserve has cancer, and some of that is from contamination of water, but also other waste, you know, where there's fracking all around our reserve and um, in Belcourt and Dunseeth. And so, you know, uh, it's important that we try to reverse this, you know, the damage that's already happened, but also continue to protect what we can for our next seven generations. So, <clears throat> 
or the three, you know, in front of us, but lately the women that we've been circling up with are talking about, you know, how do we protect it for the next seven um, and, and our prayers, you know. So that's a little bit about the Ojibwe, um, just a little bit about our perspective from back home, but also I guess one more thing I wanted to say is that you know, one of my Musham and Kokomasa grandma and grandpas talk to me about, um, you know, with tears in their eyes about what's going on in Standing Rock, you know, because I have some elders that are mixed between Standing Rock and, and Turtle Mountain, Ojibwe, and, um, and to see the tears in their eyes about the burial grounds, the water that's going to be contem you know, contaminated possibly, and all of these, the way that the black snake has come through all over Turtle Island, you know, we see that, and um, and so feel a sense of responsibility, especially as an Ishinabe Kwe, to, you know, make some whatever change and influence we can. So, yeah, Megwitch. Um, I was fortunate when we hosted, when Squaxin Island hosted the um, 2012 uh, canoe journey, um, I was fortunate enough to travel from Quileute, um, my grandfather's people down here to Squaxin, my grandmother's people. And um, Chief, Chief Frank Nelson was one of the last canoes to come into our island when we had a soft landing there. And what he shared the next day once we took protocol was that as he traveled into our territory and into the island, he noticed that we did a good job in taking care of this area because he's seen all kinds of life, you know, moving through the waters and flying up above and seeing all of the plant people. And so um, as a person from this area, I feel obligated to continue taking care of this area and support um, any other peoples that are trying to take care of their land and preserve their rights. So that's all I have. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're going to go into the water protection rallies, marches, and prayer circles that we had here in Olympia. And I think mainly they were focused in Olympia. On um, September 9th, there was a call to action. Um, one of the flyers that I saw was this one. Um, and also there was a call to action from Gala, or, um, excuse me, Dallas Gold Tooth and Lila June and other people from Standing Rock. Um, this day was a day that an easement decision was going to be ha happening by the U.S. Army Corps. And so um, I was like, I can't, you know, I can't, I have to work. <laughs> and then um, it was sent to me multiple times, and I felt that... Uh, um, the spirit, right? I prayed with tobacco. That's what we do, and um, felt that that this is something that we needed to do. And so, that's the first day that we or we came together, Patricia and I, and a couple other people at the Capitol building, and um, and started to pray together for the water and uh, do some rallying. And so, um, then throughout the next couple months, we met down by the water, by the um, Salish Sea, to bring some awareness and pray together. Um, every, every one of these events or um, circles were started with prayer as we were taught that this is part of a ceremony for us to carry the water and the protection of the water. And so <clears throat> we would start with prayer and try to prepare that good intention um, because some of this stuff, you know, can be really controversial, but also, you know, we, we just were trying, we were there for one common purpose. And so there's a, um, I'm going to go over some different events that we've had, but, um, is this our third? Do you know? Okay. But um, there was many more in Olympia, and so um, the pictures in this slide, are provided by all of the Salish land and water protectors. So there's many different pictures, some from Zoltan, some from Bob Ziegler, some from Marles, some from Mark Blaker. And so I just want to disclose that. Uh, so um, again, on September 9th is when it started and the decision was to halt any um, building under the Missouri River. And so uh, there was work to be done there at Standing Rock and at, the, at Washington, D.C. with some 
uh, agreement. So we knew that there, there would be continued need for prayer and water protections. And so uh, we just started to do that every couple weeks for the, in September and October we met um, and eventually more and more allies came, na native and non-native peoples from all surrounding um, Olympia and Thurston County came together and um, would pray together and sing songs. There was representation from, I think, um, you know, many different Salish tribes, Plateau tribes, um, Plains tribes. Um, and so it was a really unified way for us to get together and, um, and proclaim ourselves as water protectors and bring awareness to what was going on at Standing Rock and the support that was needed there as well. Um, there were people who put together drives and so we could announce that there, what's go what was going on locally and ways to support um, Standing Rock. So there's just some pictures of the uh, different events. There was an event at Olympia Film Society that played a John Trudell uh, movie uh, put together by Brian Fresina and um, we met there and prayed before and also did a water protection outside of that event as well and tried to find ways that we could collaborate with everybody in the city who were doing different types of events for Standing Rock so that we could utilize that power of unity. <clears throat> And this, um, this day was closer into November. It was pouring down rain, and you can see there was so many people there still. And um, a lot of the organization was done by Facebook and um, the Action Network, Network Action, I think is what it's called. And, and so, <clears throat> and eventually, so this, this, this day was a march. Um, that was, uh, we had a rally and then a, and a prayer. Ben Sitting Bowl um, presented that day, and Marles and Lydia uh, led the march down to the spring water, the artesian well there that day. <clears throat> and that's all of the people who marched once they, once they got to the, the fountain. Um, and this was a, a it, I don't know more action that was collaborated and there was a round and downs at the mall and then they all marched downtown. Um, and so that was another example of, of action taken in Olympia. Um, and we began to collaborate with allies again who were really interested in leading the divest actions around divesting Bank of America, Wells Fargo, all of the other banks. So those types of divesting actions were happening here in Olympia as well. Um, and then these are um, donations that, and things that hap or that were collected by Olympia Food Co-op and brought to Standing Rock by um, Ben Sitting Bull and Charlie Sitting Bull. Uh, also Lydia and um, Jesse, uh, they brought, they had a drive as well here at Evergreen Co College and Traditions Cafe. There was gathering of materials and supplies and they, the, they you know, took a trip back home to you, or to Standing Rock. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so I wasn't originally a part of the formation of the Indigenous Council. Um, I had made my way down, and I believe the Indigenous Council was formed out of the action that was um, down on the trains. Um, I believe it was led by Oli Stand. Mm -hmm. So, um, I had made it to camp just after the group that started the Indigenous Council had went into the camp, I guess, nights prior to me showing up. And um, it was an interesting experience. Um, so when the, uh, the people that showed up um, to the camp that had originated the council, they weren't well received um, by some of the people there at the camp. And um, so I went in a couple of days later, and I believe that it laid the foundation for me to be well received as an indigenous person from this area. Um, and so after that, um, I was asked to go to um, 
one of the council hearings and um, some of the people from the group or at the camp had said that they would support me in speaking or you know seeing whatever I had to um, and so I made it to one of the council meetings um, I can't think of which council meeting was that mm -hmm. the port the port yeah, commission at the port commission mm -hmm. um, and so there I learned about the indigenous council and met with them later um, didn't have the opportunity to speak to the Port because I was late or running on squawks in time. <laughs> um, so then I made it to the Indigenous Council group, which was pretty awesome. Um, met a lot of great people. Um, if the people here that are part of the Indigenous Council, could you please stand up and wave so everybody can see your faces? And it's not everybody that's a part of the Indigenous Council, it's just a couple rep representatives Marles, Shamika, Tyrone, Aaron, Aaron, and Tyrone. Mm -hmm. Um, along with several others. Um, and so being formed out of the Oli Stand group, um, we had gone into the general council meeting several times as the Indigenous Caucus um, to voice some of our concerns. And one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that if they were sending the message that they were um, standing in solidarity with Standing Rock, um, that they um, they conduct themselves in a nonviolent manner um, because that was the whole um, operation of the Standing Rock movement was nonviolent movement and so um, the first night it seemed like it was going to go well that they were going to adopt you know um, we had found some guidelines from Standing Rock that we wanted them to bring into the camp. Um, and then the next day, um, there was some conversation within the group, the Oli Stan group, and they decided against it, so we won again. And um, it was more, and one of the things that we have on here on lessons learned, from my viewpoint, um, we were going in the first night with the intention, in a good way, um, in more of an assimilation way, like take this or else kind of thing. Well, not or else, it was like take this, um, take these guidelines and adopt them. And they already had guidelines that they were operating by. Instead of having an open conversation like, hey, you know, we didn't have that, you know, integration or that dialogue where they could say, okay, well, we see this and we'll do this, you know. So that was one of the things that we learned. So. Um, we recently had an Indigenous Caucus meeting, and one of the things that we decided was that we would operate in a form and by guidelines that we as a group would operate by um, in whatever action that we would be supporting. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the things that we found and one of the things that the Indigenous Caucus wants to continue is operating in prayer. Um, the first night we went to the, uh, the camp um, as an indigenous caucus, we went in and we prayed and we came in with song. And um, there was a lot of um, uncertainty at the camp because they never knew when they were gonna be um, removed or when the raid was gonna happen. So there was a lot of tension. Um, and so we went in with prayer and with song and it really helped to ease um, some of that uncertainty and bring a little bit of peace to the camp mm -hmm. that we saw. And so that's one of the things that we would like to continue moving forward is coming in with prayer, song, and ceremony, I guess. Face-to-face mm -hmm. um, -face communication works best. Um, this is my first time being a part of any kind of movement, any kind of action, anything to this extent. And so um, what we've learned as a group that um, things can go disarray really fast. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a whole bunch of people coming together with different viewpoints, different opinions, um, different perspectives. So we found it to be best that we, we communicate with each other face to face. Um, we did a lot of our communication through a message feed on Facebook and it was just too much. Um, but it was a good way to you know, say, hey, this is what we've been doing, you know, just to give some talking points. Um, but the more important stuff is better face to face is something that we've learned. 
Um, and how I became a part of all of this is I uh, heard about what was going on at Standing Rock and um, made an effort to get over there. Um, but I've got two small children at home and wasn't able to make it. Um, and so I heard about the, um, the camp that was formed through the Salish um, the Facebook page that was created that hosts the prayer ceremonies um, out on Percival Landing. Um, I heard about the camp, and so I made it down there just to see how I could support and help out. And then here I am today, a part of this Indigenous Council. And mm -hmm. so um, it's been quite the journey. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy is that um, through the actions of Standing Rock and what's taken place over there mm -hmm. is um, Native and non-Native communities have been able to come together in a way that I think has been, um, I guess, in ways that we haven't seen before to form alliances around things, around water, around land, around, you know, things that are important to us and especially for future generations to come. So, mm -hmm. I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chi Miigwech, thank you for having us. Well, while we're waiting, uh, my name is Zoltan Grossman, and I'm a faculty member in uh, geography and native studies. I think it begins a couple before that. Um, and uh, though I'm in native, I teach in native studies, I really more study the non-native governments and corporations and communities that stand in the way of tribal sovereignty and treaty rights and try to help shoo them out of the way. Um, and. Uh, uh, very much been involved in alliances over the years. So I want to talk some about uh, the Bakken oil um, that is the source of the Dakota Access Pipeline and the oil trains, some about alliances, and show some images from uh, Standing Rock, all in about 15 minutes. No, no, no sweat. <laughs> so um, we in the Northwest are in a particularly strong position geographically. We have a geographic responsibility in a sense because the fossil fuel basins, such as Bakken oil, such as tar sands oil, are locked up in the interior of the continent, and they need to build pipelines and trains to get them to ports for the global market. They also need to bring in equipment to extract the coal and the oil in the interior of the, uh, of the continent. So in a sense, we're a choke point. We're a thin green line of very environmentally and climate conscious citizens that are sit in the, in the way of that. And so when it comes to Bakken oil, I think it's uh, one of the most evil <laughs> uh, industrial developments we've seen in a long time in North America. Um, and we've had oil spills. We have contamination of groundwater from fracking. We have the social costs, the man camps, the influx of uh, workers making both uh, native and non-native women uh, from the area unsafe. We have huge um, numbers of water and chemical truck accidents um, because of the huge numbers of the trucks going through. Uh, Candy Mossett, um, a Fort Berthold tribal member, uh, was actually Skyped in a, uh, about a year ago to a, a first Indigenous Climate Justice Symposium we hold in this room. She described the diseases, the displacement that tribal members are having because of the oil fracking. And it really is about oil fracking. Usually you hear about fracking in the context of gas. But in this case, um, we have uh, the gas actually being flared off um, because it's less um, profitable to the oil companies. And so you have, it looks like a city between Seattle and Minneapolis circled there. That's the Bakken oil basin with the gas flaring going on, kind of like what is happening in Nigeria that's so opposed by people there. And of course, we have the oil trains. Bakken oil is more volatile, more explosive. So we had a huge uh, explosion a few years ago in Quebec that killed 47 people that were gathered at a folk music concert. Uh, we've also had other explosions in 
uh, around the country. So the danger of Bakken oil isn't contained uh, to North Dakota. And we in Washington have these very, very direct connections. Not only do, are the oil trains coming from the Bakken Basin uh, into Washington to try and unload at our ports and BC ports, uh, but we also have supplies like the fracking sands, propants, that prop open the bedrock cracks uh, for the fracking process to take place. And we have um, proposals for oil terminals that would simply bring in more oil trains and bring in more of the risk of explosion and of contamination of the coastal ecosystem with the fish, with the shellfish that is so treasured. So this is a conceptual map I made of the Bakken oil fracking monster, kind of showing the um, the oil trains coming, the fracking sands going in, the pipelines like Dakota Access, like the series of Enbridge pipelines going out to the Great Lakes, but showing how these are all connected in a sense, how corporations connect us up with each other, uh, that we have to respond by connecting alliances up with each other. People who don't necessarily have a lot in common, we're already connected by this. It's simply a matter of recognizing it and acting on it. So acting means um, standing against the oil trains in places like Seattle, where the trains go right by the major stadiums. It means uh, standing with the people in Vancouver and Grays Harbor that are fighting against their ports being turned into gigantic oil terminals, and in particular in Grays Harbor, led by the Quinault Nation which has been trying to protect for years its blueback salmon, its uh, razor clams, it's uh, very much afraid that when the oil is loaded onto ships, onto barges, and out in the Pacific, um, that one spill will completely wipe out all of the treaty rights that they had recognized in the Bolt decision. And so it's the Bolt decision which also gives them a very strong position. And Billy Frank Jr., the, actually the morning that he passed, his last blog was to support the Quinault Nation in its stand against the Grace Harbor oil terminal. He's speaking to us that this is something that is really resonating and is very important. So um, if people ask, I can't go to Standing Rock, what can I do? I would say support Quinault. Um, last year they had a shared water, shared values, uh, flotilla and rally, um, and uh, they brought together uh, Quinault with some of the crab fishers, the oyster people, who had previously been at odds with the, tr with the nation over treaty rights, but are st standing together against the shared threat uh, to the resources. And of course, here, I really want to commend all the people that were involved in the blockade of the train for a whole week um, to try and block some of the propents uh, that are actually uh, enabling the fracking to happen in North Dakota. So this is all connected. This is the same oil that's going through the Dakota Access Pipeline. But these are all examples of alliances um, that are incredibly effective, um, joining together native and non-native people. And in particular, I find it interesting when it's white ranchers, fishers, farmers, some of the people who have been at odds for decades over natural resources, over treaty rights, but when the water is threatened, that's when they start to open their eyes and not just come together against something, but start to learn from their indigenous neighbors in a way that they never have. This is happening all over the country where I'm from originally in Wisconsin, where Tina's from, um, into Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, and of course in this region. I'm actually um, putting out a book about this in June uh, because there are so many encouraging stories, and I, I think especially now when everyone is wondering about uh, why many people in the rural white working class voted for Trump and what can be done about that, tribes are really in the forefront of trying to communicate with and reach those people and try to put them on a different path. And in particular, in Lakota country, in Ocheti Shako in Lakota, Dakota, Nakota country, where treaty rights have been important for so long, there was an alliance uh, called the Black Hills Alliance um, back in the late 70s against coal and uranium mining, um, where there were huge uh, marches and rallies where some of the white ranchers uh, started to come around and work together with Lakota successfully to protect those sacred hills from coal and uranium mining. This is me as an 18-year-old with a little peach fuzz um, 
with the Black Hills Alliance is kind of how I got a starting in activism, learned a lot more from the activism than from uh, academic studies. And 11,000 people came together back then in 1980 uh, against um, the coal and uranium and came together in what was called a survival gathering. And so what happened at Standing Rock is not something that just came out of nowhere. It came out of decades of people organizing their own communities and joining up with other communities. The first Cowboy Indian Alliance was organized against a bombing, depleted uranium bombing range planned in a sacred canyon in the southern uh, Black Hills, uh, the CIA, Cowboy Indian Alliance. And, uh, and it, the area not only was prevented from being a bombing range, it was turned into a wild horse sanctuary. Uh, that's still there today. It's a really cool place to visit. The second CIA, Cowboy Indian Alliance, was opposing a coal railroad um, from uh, Wyoming to Minnesota. And the third one, of course, that you've heard about was founded to, against the Keystone XL pipeline that would have brought Alberta tar sands uh, through the Northern Plains. And a couple years ago, there was this huge rally in Washington, D.C. Uh, that brought together uh, some of the ranchers, uh, Lakota, uh, Ponca, Pawnee people from uh, South Dakota and Nebraska in particular, and got the attention of the White House and President Obama at that time uh, to cancel that pipeline. And so um, Faith Spotted Eagle, uh, one of the leaders, said, we come from two cultures that clashed over land, so this is a healing for the generations. And um, she has been... Uh, a really a key figure. One of the reasons that when talking with Robert Satyakum, uh, her name came up, I said, hey, why not vote for her for president when you're at the Electoral College in December? So he did. And so uh, the idea is that you really want to, anything you do like Robert did, is to gesture towards the struggle at Standing Rock as in a way, in the long term, what people are going to remember even longer than the presidential election. So I want to close by showing some of the images. I was out there at the same time as Marles with my wife, Debbie McNutt. And um, this, was, uh, this is the route of the Dakota Access Pipeline that goes just north of the sovereign reservation territory of the Standing Rock Reservation, but within the treaty territory in Light Gray. I have, by the way, uh, maps back there of the fossil fuel basins and these routes. You can see the original route of the pipeline that took it near Bismarck, um, the state capital, uh, but it was moved, kind of one of these racialized shell games uh, that happens around the country, moved to right next to where the water supply is of uh, Standing Rock. And the crossing um, is in a very wide area that would be very hard to get to if there was some kind of uh, uh, rupture of the pipeline under, underneath. This is the spot actually where the pipeline would cross. It's a beautiful spot, with the sacred Missouri River. This is what people are afraid of. This is the Moscow River when an oil pipeline ruptured and exploded underneath the river and there's no way to get to it to repair it. It just has to burn itself out and contaminates the entire river. So oil spills, oil kills, water is life. This is uh, thanks to all the faculty and staff who contributed uh, a bunch of supplies for Debbie and I to take out. We stuffed the back of our Corolla and uh, brought, uh, brought uh, love from Olympia. Uh, crossing the border into North Dakota, you immediately see oil wells, you immediately see fracking pads, and of course you've seen the Ocheti Shakoin camp. Uh, this has become a very familiar site. Uh, it's very well organized. And um, this is security at the gate. And the rules um, that uh, uh, Noel and Patricia were talking about is are very much uh, embedded and have been embedded uh, at the camp from the beginning. And you first notice the intertribal unity with the embassy row, the flags coming in. You also notice um, the prayerful actions, the prayer marches that take place. Uh, Every day, uh, this isn't in the Western paradigm of protest. Even though a lot of the focus is on the blockades, I also, this is Facebook Hill, the only place you can get a signal, um, where a lot of the videos are sent, sent out. But it felt to me like a liberated zone. It felt to me like um, a future, how a future society should be of sharing and respect, drawing on 
past society of, of indigenous protocols. So to be able to feed thousands of people a day uh, without money being exchanged, to see the huge mountains of food that have been donated from tribes, from churches around the country, the school supplies uh, for the camp school for the children, a uh, radio station that was set up for the camp area, the uh, renewable energy, the solar panels, wind power uh, brought into kind of, and they're building now an eco village to kind of show it's not just about opposing an oil pipeline, it's about what are we going to uh, say yes to. And whenever uh, tribal representatives would come in uh, by bus, uh, they would, there would be cheering and there would be a welcoming. There would be a sharing of songs and dances. It was like being at Canoe Journey all over again. And um, this is uh, a map which was really amazing of where people came from across the continent. And this was when Quinault arrived for a canoe journey. Um, uh, talking about the oil terminal that they're fighting in Graves Harbor and connecting it with the struggle at Standing Rock and being part of, and this is a Clinkett Haida canoe, in the back there is Ken Hoyt, an Evergreen alum, uh, Stephanie McMaster, some people know her, she's in the canoe as well. And so canoes started to arrive when we were there from around the continent uh, to participate in this amazing canoe journey from Bismarck uh, down to the Cannonball River. And so to see the teepees and the canoes together was so uplifting and the solidarity that was in that kind of message was, was also so inspiring. And um, uh, to see some familiar faces, uh, but to see the welcome, the hospitality that the Ocheti Shakoin uh, uh, nation had for the Pacific Northwest people. And you had Hanford McLeod also talking about um, the solidarity from people who are facing coal and oil trains here uh, with Standing Rock. This is a crowd, the crowd defying a, a helicopter that was flying over. The militarization was starting at the time when I was there in September. And this is, I think there's a lot of attention on the intertribal unity and not as much understanding, especially among non-native folks, of the importance of the intra-tribal unity that we saw at Standing Rock. This is um, the tribal chair, um, uh, Dave Archambault the third, together with uh, the spiritual leader, Arvo Looking Horse, together with the activist, uh, traditional uh, elder, um, Faith Spotted Eagle, Back 30 years ago, you never would have seen tribal government working together with spiritual leadership, working together with activist leadership. And um, so that kind of cohesion has also been tested and has been very, has been challenged, but it's been very crucial. Uh, this are folks from the Indigenous Environmental Network, Tom and Dallas Goldtooth that uh, we worked with in Wisconsin against a mine. I went out with Myron Dewey of Digital Smoke Signals with his famous drone. <laughs> to um, go to a blockade and document. So um, we did a lot of uh, work in Wisconsin documentation, witnessing. So I did some of that out there. We were trying to find the blockade with this hand-drawn map of the pipeline. And this is the swath. It's 100, 150 feet wide of destruction that goes through these farmlands. A lot of the farmers were not very happy about this either. Um, and so you had, at this particular site, a lockdown of uh, bulldozers by uh, uh, tribal members, both from Ocheti Shakoin and elsewhere, who were uh, basically stopped work there for a day. And uh, this happens day after day after day. It's either the people locking down or it's the weather locking them down <laughs> with rain or, or snow. So Akichi Tawin, that's a warrior woman. This is a woman from Pine Ridge who locked herself down. Uh, there weren't arrests these days, but the spirit of resistance and of um, renewal, of uh, revitalization was palpable at this site. And people were spray painting, that was kind of controversial, but the things they were spray painting got to my, to my heart. Think of your kids, um, protect your mother. Um, this isn't the, the normal kind of just spray painting graffiti out of anger. But of course, the militarization, the response of the state, this is FBI. Uh, we actually um, talked with them for a little while to kind of document what they were doing. Uh, North Dakota State Patrol with a little cultural appropriation in its symbol. They were still in regular uniform at this time. It was more a few days later that the large scale um, militarization started. The National Guard had just taken over the roadblock, which I think was 
partly to keep non-native people from seeing the camp and visiting the camp and to criminalize and demonize the people who are there and to try and scare away other people in the petro state of North Dakota. Uh, I saw the, along with Marles, the, the canine unit that only a few days before had unleashed dogs, attacked dogs uh, against the water protectors. And so we see this kind of militarization, which is very expensive. It's cost 22 million so far, um, and uh, is meant to be very visible and vi very intimidating, turning these local county sheriff's departments into basically uh, SWAT teams and miniature miniaturized armies. And this is a letter that uh, Winona LaDuke and retired Army Colonel Ann Wright and I wrote to uh, law enforcement and National Guard in North Dakota. And we have had reports of individual uh, refusals on the part of some of the police and National Guard in particular. Uh, police departments in places like Minnesota and Montana that initially were sending their people to Standing Rock, pulling them back and saying that their citizens are not approving of, uh, of sending um, their people in. So um, uh, there's been some minor encouraging signs in the face of this overwhelming militarization. But, but in all, it's, it all has to do, in, finally, about money. And uh, there are a number of really interesting studies that show that protests do increase costs for corporations and their staff time and their uh, billions of dollars they have to spend on PR because they know if they don't do that, that people are going to end up supporting people like the water protectors. And so the more delay in the project, and the camps have delayed the project, um, the more the company and the investors, the shareholders, look at the bottom line. Now, but now, of course, we're in a different situation. This is documentation of Trump's personal investment in the pipeline and energy transfer partners. So it's, it's hard to see what's going to happen next, and yet the people are very resilient and prepared for whatever comes next. Um, because really this is the first time that this kind of alliance has gotten uh, national and international support and has uh, has really uh, formed a nexus. So after I saw Rogue One, I just couldn't resist um, making the comparison. <laughs> that really rebellions are built on hope and what Standing Rock has really brought, uh, even to places as distant as Olympia, is hope. And I uh, want to invite you all to the second annual Indigenous Climate Justice Symposium, which will be held probably in this room, May 4th through 6th. And we'll be having some of the voices, both from this area, from the Pacific Northwest and the Northern Plains, uh, telling some of these stories firsthand. So thank you. Hello, my name is Erin Genia, and I work here at the Longhouse. I'm also a two-time Evergreen grad. And I wanna say thank you to everybody in this room for coming and being here today and for caring about this issue. And I especially wanna thank my fellow speakers who came up here today to talk about some of the things that are going on. Um, and uh, I also wanna give a, a thank you to the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes on whose land we are. And I also want to thank my ancestors and my children for helping me along my path. Water is life. We hear that a lot and it, with this movement, and it cuts straight to the heart of what it is that we're talking about when we, when we discuss the issue of oil extraction and energy extraction, is um, that we are our very lives are at stake when we think about the way that climate change is progressing at an exponential rate, and we think about the toxins that are taking our lives. And so water is life, mni wichoni. Um, I'm a Dakota person. Um, that uh, I'm from Sisseton and Wapiton on the Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota. And my tribes are part of the Seven Council of Fires, Ochiti Shekawin. And this movement that we have seen has brought together our seven council fires in a way that hasn't happened in over 100 years. And so it's really a historic thing. And um, I 
I just think that there are so many reasons for that. Uh, now, at this time, it's so crucial. But also um, because we are building upon the movement work that has been done um, over many years. And um, especially with this particular movement, we are incorporating our values as tribal people, uh, as Dakota people, um, which are prayer, respect, generosity, courage, honesty, compassion, and wisdom. And those are more than just platitudes. Those are our way of looking at the world. Those are our very approach to life. It's called Wo Dakota. And I just want to say, as a Dakota person, I'm really upset that Dakota Access Pipeline has named their instrument of death after my tribe. So I'm up here today because I'm an artist. And I've been really inspired by the amazing artwork that has come out of this movement. And when I think about the artwork, which I'm going to show to you now, um, it makes me think that the movement with the best art wins. And I think that's true because artists are at the forefront of a cultural shift. And there are many reasons why that is. And so I'm going to start off here. One of those reasons is it's the combination of your head, your heart, and your hands. And here we have um, Monty Singer. He's a Diné artist. And he, uh, he's a, a beautiful painter. You can see here his work. Tawara Tahiri, she is a Maori woman. And this particular image is interesting. It's beautiful. And it's interesting because when she made it, she posted it on social media and she said, go ahead and use this to the movement. And people did. And they took it. And you can see it all over um, different signs. And it just really it kind of went viral. And Tawara is a person who um, is a friend of mine because of the work of the Longhouse because of uh, the bridges that the Longhouse has built with Pacific Rim artists, particularly Maori artists in New Zealand. She has come here. She was an artist in, resident here, in residence here at the Longhouse. She's just an um, amazing person. Kaila Farrell-Smith is Klamath. Um, she is a, uh, another artist that is associated with the Longhouse here. And she's a painter. This piece, you, if you um, are interested in seeing it, is in a show that's happening right now in, in Tacoma at Spaceworks Gallery. And I encourage you all to go. Um, it's open until, I believe it's February 16th. And some of the pieces that um, you'll see in this presentation are there, and I definitely encourage you to go and see them in person. And they are for sale, and the proceeds uh, are going to the Standing Rock struggle. So here's a, a cartoon from Marty Tubals. He's a syndicated uh, cartoonist working at Indian Country Media Today. And um, I'm going to take a moment to just talk about the power in art and um, what are some of the ways that art can move people to act. Um, by giving form to the intangible, by speaking with images and visions that propel the imagination, by tapping into a viewer's innate sense of justice and deeply held beliefs and values, helping a person to identify with something that's bigger than, than, than themselves alone, activating a person's sense that anything is possible, touching upon emotions which can generate a desire to act, Using the power of creativity, artists inspire others, can inspire others, to be their better selves. Oh, going back here, I wanted to draw attention to um, this artist here. Her name is Elijah Naranjo Morse. She's a Tewa artist from Santa Clara Pueblo. And she created this, um, I would call it an installation um, at the um, American Indian Museum, Contemporary Native American Museum in Santa Fe. And she did it a year ago, but then she came back um, so inspired by what 
had been happening at Standing Rock. And she updated her mural to put signs. All of the little figures there are now carrying signs uh, supporting Standing Rock Tribe. Here, uh, John Edward Smith is a Skokomish artist who has been very actively um, working with the Longhouse to carve our fiber art studio. And if you guys um, ever have the opportunity to check out what's going on in, in the carving studio right out here, I definitely encourage you to do so. He's one of the amazing artists who's working on that project. Here, Christy Bellacourt, a very famous Métis artist, has um, produced these pieces that she posted al online along with another artist whose work I'll show you in a second. And so these have been uh, pictures that you've probably seen. Um, they've gone viral as well. And they have been, um, she put them on there and said, please use these, and people did. Here's a person that she worked with on that, um, Isaac Murdoch, who is Ojibwe. And um, many of the artists that I've featured in this presentation are native artists, but there are also are na non-native artists um, who also ha feel very strongly about this, just like um, there are so many allies, non-native allies, who are stepping up and um, doing something about this, spreading the word, and also using their actions um, to bring attention to what's happening. This artist is part of a um, an activist printmaking collective called Just Seeds. And several of the other artists here um, that I'm presenting about are in that collective. Another artist here um, from that collective, and in this particular piece, this print, she is referencing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And you know, really bringing it back to that this is, this is a violation, what's happening is a violation of our human rights. Another um, person who is from this Just Seeds Collective. If you don't know who they are, you should definitely look at them online. There is amazing work coming out of uh, this collective. And this, um, you know, I thought was very interesting, a very uh, important piece because it draws attention to the people, the person who is, has been in charge of the militarized response to the water protectors. And really, I'm trying to hold this person to account. Here, um, a great uh, image of solidarity um, between uh, Black Lives Matter and um, no DAPL. A Diné artist here, Jonathan Nelson, another person who has put his work online, uh, free for people to use for this purpose. Some really uh, beautiful pieces, and this piece here is one of my favorite ones. This pipe does not break. That's our sacred Chanupa pipe. Sadie Redwing, a beautiful piece. Um, she also is a part of the Just Seeds Collective, Ni Wichoni. Jesus Barraza is an a awesome artist, um, also a part of the collective. John Pepian, this is, I thought this was a really interesting piece here. It um, references um, the ledger drawings and it shows a fist holding um, our uh, sacred sweetgrass and an upside down American flag, which is a symbol for distress. There's so much artwork coming out of the movement. There's beadwork coming out of the movement. I wasn't able to find out who made these ones, but I wanted to share those. Melanie Cervantes is an artist. You may have seen this work as well around um, on different social media platforms. Um, yet another artist whose work is in the Just Seeds Collective. Here is this a mural that um, was done by several different artists of different tribal backgrounds, and it can be seen in the mural in the mural alley or art alley in Rapid City. Asia Tail, Cherokee. She is the curator of the uh, Protect the Sacred show that I was talking about that you guys should go see in Tacoma. She's a wonderful artist. 
Here's a piece that I did about pipelines and oil spills, drawing attention to um, human beings being at the center of this crisis, both responsible for it and also endangered by it. And here, this is a picture by my son Sam, who is also an artist. And it, it's a little bit blurry. Um, it's at the show in Tacoma. So I'd like you to, if you have a chance, please do see the show. But I wanted to show it because Sam is 15. And you know he's depicting in his piece this violence. And it's just very disturbing um, that our children are you know, living with this legacy. Our native children are living with the legacy of violence against who they are and their pr very presence um, on the land. A beautiful drum. I'm, and I'm just going to kind of go through here a little faster. Nicholas Galanin, a silver artist. Ryan Federson, um, a piece you could see in the Protect the Sacred show in Tacoma. Here, this is Dylan Miner, Métis artist. He's a professor, um, I think at the uh, University of Wisconsin, perhaps. I'm not exactly sure where he's a professor, but he is also an artist, um, part of the Just Seeds Collective. And he did this piece right after um, the evening where there was a confrontation on the, the bridge, the backwater bridge, and um, the police sprayed in sub-freezing temperatures water cannons at the water protectors. And here he says, water is medicine, water is not a weapon. Frank Buffalo Hyde, um, he does art, uh, art a, a lot of his art is about popular images, and so here you can see, um, you may have heard about the dogs, and Zoltan also talked about the dogs that were um, used um, very inhumanely uh, uh, um, against water protectors early this fall. More pieces by Dylan Miner. You may have also seen these. Some of these have just gone viral. Yataka Star Fields. Just some just absolutely beautiful work. This is a this is an interesting art uh, project that happened. Uh, Chanupa Hanska Luzier. He's a an artist who is from Standing Rock, and he put together a. Um, he created these mirrors, these mirror shield things that people, water protectors, could use. They could bring it right up to the police line on the very front line so that the police could see themselves and see what they look like um, in that, that out, outfit of terror. Lindley Logan, our very own Lindley Logan, he's a staff person here at the Longhouse, very gifted printmaker and artist. He is Seneca. John Fedorov, um, a Diné artist here who has, this painting is just so compelling. Diné artist Remy, a printmaker who created these banners that people wear um, to show that they're water protectors. And uh, much has been said about the difference between protesters and protectors. And many of the, um, the people at Standing Rock have said, we are protectors. This is our sacred duty. We, this is our land. We're not protesting. We're here because we're standing up for who we are. We're protecting our lives, and we're protecting our land. And so here you can see his art um, was worn by the uh, Standing Rock tribal chairman. Then wanted to bring in the artwork of Andy Everson, who created this, uh, this, this piece for the Idol No More um, movement. And so that has still, that was an image that had gone viral that has, is still resonating. And just the connections, wanted to show this piece because of the connections between the Idol No More movement and, um, and what's happening with Standing Rock and, you know, the, the fact that this, is spreading, that these movements are spreading, and they need to, because it's uh, the attack on our lands 
and our resources is, is happening at an exponential rate, and I assume that will only continue under the Trump administration. Another piece by Christy Belcourt, showing here that women um, are at the heart of this movement. This is a very interesting piece by uh, Gilbert Kills Pretty Enemy the Third, um, and there's just a lot going on in this piece. Here, Demian Deneyazi, he is a, uh, another artist that the Longhouse has worked with. Star Hardridge, Muscogee Creek. And um, I also wanted to bring in a couple of photographers because there's some beautiful photography um, that's going on in, in um, Native communities. Here we've got Spokane photographer Alex Flett. And he's, this is just one image. He went and he documented um, a lot of what's going on over there. And I want to end here with Matika Wilbur, a photograph that she took. Um, and I, I'm showing this because it shows the immensity of the universe, the sky, our galaxy, and just wanted to um, you know, impress upon us that we're just such a small piece of the greater universe. And yet, um, we have our own power within us to make change. And so just kind of wanted to leave you with that thought. So thank you very much. Good day, everybody. My name is Tyrone Costin. My parents are Rodney and Colleen Costin. I've been asked here today to uh, read a little poetry um, and I guess to just kind of share with you some of what uh, the statement water is life means to me. And uh, I was asked when I got, first got here um, if I would, had prepared anything new, and in fact, most of my material whenever I come out is new. Um, and I do that because in our philosophy, um, I'm a member of the Chief Joseph Band of Nez Perce people, we believe that it's um, somewhat dishonest to come with your material too well prepared uh, in order to tell you how this movement affected me, in order to tell you how I felt at this time being a native person in Olympia, um, I couldn't come to you with a bunch of prepared material. And in fact, when I first write, started writing this, I wrote some very angry pieces. And I simply wanted to contextualize that because what I'm going to read today um, might not sound like it's a lot of poetry about Standing Rock. I think I have one poem about a river. Um, but I was reflecting on that statement, water is life. And I realized that I had talked a lot about the water aspect of it, but not that life aspect of it. And when I started concentrating on that and talking with some of my mentors and elders, I realized something that had bothered me about my engagement with things like Standing Rock. And that's um, the fact that we still deal with an image of native people, even when we're hyper visible at places like Dakota, that we need to always be the spiritual advisor, the warrior. We need to be that super woke poet every moment that we're alive. And we are that. We're brilliant. We have great political strategy. We're in the Constitution. Every good part of Yarl's government is from us. But we're also funny yeah. and caring. We make some really good soup. Yeah. And if you're a native person, you know, you're brilliant and you have a good community and you have a lot of backing. And should you so fortunately be Nez Bruce, you get to be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and I was feeling really down before I came here. And um, fortunately, my mother visited me. And I, I just said, you know what, with this election, 
I know things are going to get bad in Dakota, and I know things are going to get bad here in a year or two. And you know what, I just, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And she told me something. She said, you know, when you were a kid, you were helping me with these signs. Do you remember what those signs said? And I don't know, I was 10. And uh, she explained to me that once upon a time, the greatest threat to native sovereignty actually came from Washington State in the form of a man called Slade Gordon. <laughs> it's been 16 years, you're still getting that. <laughs> but what she told me is that we beat him. And what she told me then was that her mentor, Lucy Covington, was there when termination came to Washington State. And we won that too. And so I started reflecting on what it meant to be a Native person, what it meant to be alive as a Native person. And so I thought I would come to you with a few pieces that showed some of that political history, but also some of that resilience within our communities, um, those things that you don't always see when we have our fists raised in our air, because that's a big part of who we are, but a big part of who I am as a Native person as well, is going to places like my grandmother's 65th birthday party and walking in and Yaya is on a stripper pole for some reason. So I really, I want to thank my fellow panelists for bringing the knowledge, for bringing the hard truths, for showing you the tragedy, because then I get to come up here and talk to y'all about grandmas on stripper poles in a really good suit. <laughs> it wasn't hard to erase them, to leave us without our heroes, because ours never had time for press conferences, and it was harder for the news to wrap a lie around anything more complex than Indian woman text surprise to Congress, or Native Americans protest government project. So all of our work became blurry, and we teach it in one month out of one year that we have to share with colonization's birthday party. And so the growth of things becomes natural. The things that were won become gifts, and we forget. We forget that termination was defeated here by raggedy Indians. We forget that this land was the land that won the Nisqually fishing war. We forget that we've been winning this thing ever since a $20 bill shifted the goalpost to total annihilation and labeled that saving the children. And that once upon a time, there was a man named Slate who showed the world you can still be betrayed by the phrase just like everybody else. And in our darkest time, we forget we kicked his ass too. Because you see, they buried it so that you would feel like we were unprecedented, so we, you would think that your people never mastered the weapon beyond the bow, so that you wouldn't think of yourself as the first and only rebel and not part of the resistance that may as well be a dynasty. And so that all of this is so that you will never know that every subtle BIA takeover, every stop pipeline, every job program, and every block bill is a battle won in the war that never quite ended, just came, became polite. And um, sometimes I wonder why I love this river so much. And I suppose it's because it reminds me of myself. We're both fragile but powerful, constant and bitter, always running yet always shackled. We both seem to be disinterested in the intent of our oppressor, but vulnerable to the impact of their actions. And in that way, we understand each other. So I try not to ask her for much, because I know she's tired. She's holding on to so many lives already. And she loves me so much, she would destroy herself if I would just ask. So every time I take, I have to remind myself to show restraint, hold back my hunger, put a leash on my greed, because she would die for me, but I couldn't live without her. I'm going to skip this depressing one. <laughs> nah. Um, and I feel like I have to apologize for this one a little bit in advance. Um, I feel like sometimes I'm being disrespectful, or I've been told sometimes I'm being disrespectful when I talk about certain ways that we handle tragedy, or when I let people into certain processes. And I don't want it to sound like I don't consider how bad things could become, or that the people I'm referencing don't consider how bad the things we can, come, can become. 
Um, so when I talk about things that are somewhat inappropriate or somewhat gauche, uh, I feel like I can only tell the truth in these pieces and these conversations are basically how I go throughout my day when I go home. Um, and there's a certain levity to survival in Eastern Washington. Uh, and I don't think that it always translates well. I, I'll try to communicate it a little bit here. Um, but yeah, uh, this is something I was actually writing on my way up to the stage and uh, yeah. <laughs> Too often I find myself in awkward situations. For instance, I once saw a 60 year old man buying maxi pads and I thought it was a joke. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think anything of most men buying feminine products. It's just that this particular 60 year old man was an uncle of mine and he had a reputation for buying random objects and turning them into laughter. For instance, he had his mother's eyes in his breast pocket. And according to his driver's license, Elvis never died. He just moved to the res and nobody thought to check there. <laughs> so I saw the pads, I had to know what we, he was up to. And he could have chosen any way to say it. He could have cried and he knew that I would have never judged him. So I think I knew what he was doing when he chuckled and said, well, when the doctor, doctor says when you get to a certain age, you need these. We both laughed for a good minute before he showed me the real reason, that a short time ago the doctor had cut the cancer out of him and told him on occasions the suture would bleed. Doc also said that if you don't want to mess with gauze, the pads will do in a pinch. I watched a 60-year-old man laugh at his own pleading wound. And I laughed with him because I've seen the alternative. I've seen what happens when we forget that we can laugh at the apocalypse. When I look in his eyes, I know he's seen it too. We're both quite learned in the ways of despair and tragedy. And we both know that we can listen to the demons that constantly whisper, give up, or we can laugh our way back into the light. And I can't say for sure if it was making himself forget his proximity to death or if he needed to be <laughs> as strong as a native woman that day. All I know is that the doctor gave him six months, and he's been laughing for about a year. Mm -hmm. All right, now we can do the depressing one. <laughs> no, they're not that depressing. As, um, these next two, um, Native people, or at least my people, have a really odd relationship with death. Um, Y'all's funerals actually don't make a lot of sense to us. Um, everybody's sad the entire time. <laughs> um, and I don't know, uh, there's a practice, and I don't know if I should be sharing this, but uh, I can get yelled at later. Um, there's a practice that we, we feel like we can talk to people that have forgotten about us, or that the appropriate time to think about those things is um, before the sun reaches its high point. And I wrote this piece when I was looking at um, some things that I wasn't quite able to finish. Um, I'm pretty sure any native person you ever walk into has one craft or one skill at least where it's like, I can't bead, so I'm not an Indian. Um, <laughs> Uh, my family weaves museum pieces, and if you ever see me try to do it, you know why I write poetry, so. <laughs> There's a good basket in there. That's what she used to say when I tried to throw away the tangled knots that were supposed to be my first weaves. And I wish I understood what she was saying, that eventually you can work on your flaws, and that every minor warp and little splinter just adds to the canon of your work. I wish I understood that because I would have understood why she said it's supposed to be beautiful. Every time there was work to say, she would come and say it must be beautiful. If something was worthy of your time, it's worthy of your best, and I, the delinquent child, was always worthy of her time. And when I became that delinquent child, I had heard another word. I heard, it doesn't come back that way. She'd tell me that whenever I'd find myself running my mouth down a road that would only lead to more trouble. She would hold me there and say, own your words. She'd tell me this, selecting each letter, letter to weave six lessons into three syllables. 
And sometimes I wish the lessons would have never ended. I wish she could have taught me forever. But instead, she found it more prudent to show me eternity. So I wasn't there the night she ran out of lessons. That night she di drifted into a deserved rest. So there's no longer someone that can warn me about the rewards and risks of the directions I go in. But sometimes in the morning, I find myself asking if I'm on the right path. Mm. And sometimes in my morning, I feel the smallest weight on my chest and a voice saying, there's a good man in there. How am I on time? <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so same practice, slightly more optimistic poem. I'll skip a, the last one just because we're short on time. Uh, but my last trip home, I was asked to come in and see a kid or look at a kid uh, who was going through something that I went through when I was younger. And I had to tell their parents not to worry about it because um, it's something that most people grow out of or you at least become quiet about doing it <laughs> eventually. <clears throat> when I was a child, I would talk to the dead. It wasn't like the movies. There were no faces jumping out of the walls or sudden frights from wailing specters. It's just something that kids do sometimes back home, Con having conversations with elders they couldn't have met most people think that you grow out of it as soon as you accept the world for what it is and deny what it could be. But I've been practicing in the morning, having coffee with the dead. It's not an unpleasant thing. Turns out spirits and memories like a good cup of coffee. They take it sweeter than I remember. The bitter notes are sometimes drowned by too much sugar in what they're saying, but I don't mind. Most of them spend an entire lifetime being angry. Some of them say they died when they ran out of anger. All of them say that it helps to see us out there, marching, working, lobbying, resisting. They said that they realized something when they met as the Undead Indigenous Council. They learned that our competing schools of thought aren't actually competing, that legislatures and lawyers can provide valuable cover, and that sometimes a window needs breaking. And in fact, you can be a proud savage, as long as you don't let anybody else call us that. <laughs> they tell me to stay out of the way of, of things I can't touch. That knowing your role means that you can't do everything. But mostly they talk about how good the coffee is and to shut up during the price is right. Mm -hmm. <laughs>